So the content of first quiz is going to be the content of this study set. Some modeling questions, convexity, uh, graphical representation, uh, like is a profit or is a cost lines. You need to understand all of them to be prepared for the first quiz. So hopefully you can see the uh, question here. You already have the question, by the way. So uh, I would go through the question very fast and uh, mostly focus on the solutions. So the first question is related to the hop problem, hop location problem. So the question is asking, uh, in Turkey we have like 81 cities and uh, Turkish airline is trying to uh, find some of the, uh, I mean associate some of these cities as hubs and the rest as demand nodes. So for example, it may be fixed number of hubs, let's say P number of hubs, or it may not be uh, mentioned, but it's like this. Uh, Let's, so assume that we have like some cities as nodes here. And uh, according to the cost of transportation and the demand between the cities, so here in this question the demand is like the number of passengers daily going from one city to another or like uh, if it's related to the transportation of cargo, it's uh, just how much cargo is transported uh, from one city to another. So it's the demand. And it has some cost. So these two factors are important. If we know that which cities we want to uh, fix as hops, for, for example, in this example, let's say these uh, four center nodes, the, the model has decided to uh, associate as no, uh, hops. So the other demand nodes gonna be uh, connected to one of, one of these hubs, not, not just more than one, just one of these hubs. And the hubs themselves are gonna be connected to each other all the way. Meaning that the hubs should, should be connected all together. And the, the model would associate each, each of the other demand nodes to one hub. For example, assume that the model results, one of the results can be this. As you see, uh, as you see, so among the n number of cities that has been uh, assigned in this question, we say that, okay, four, uh, four number of them are hubs which are all connected to each other, and the other cities are connected to just one hub. So, how the transportation works, if I'm in node I, and I want to transfer uh, some passengers or some cargo to node J, the things that is gonna happen is that, uh, I go to my hub, uh, I'm sorry, I'm, I go to my hub, Of course, this hub is connected to the hub of node J, so uh, transportation from the, the first hub to the second hub, and then there is a transportation from this hub to node J. So all the uh, transportation is gonna happen in this way. If it's from hub to hub, it's very easy, it just, has just one transportation, but if uh, it's a node from two nodes that are like demand nodes, not hops, like three parts uh, transportation, so that we can go from I to J. So, the question is giving us uh, the demand between any pair of cities I and J with WIJ, which is a non-negative value, and it's specifying that the demand going from I to J is not necessarily equal to the demand going from J to I, which makes sense. I mean, I just consider transportation of passengers with Turkish airline going from 
Ankara to Istanbul is not necessarily uh, equal to the number of people going from uh, Istanbul to Ankara. And uh, what else? So all the other informations, I already gave it to you. So the thing that matters, as I told you, is the cost of uh, transporting one demand to another. So uh, assuming that uh, part A, for example, it's P hub median. From the name of it, you can understand that the question is telling us that we need just P hubs. So the number of hubs are fixed. But the question is telling us that we want to minimize the total cost of transportation between uh, two demand points. So knowing this, we want to formulate our problems. Before going there, there is one other factor, Cij, which is the unit shipment cost between location I and J. So how to model this problem? First of all, the parameters. Okay, big N is the set of all cities. WIJ, the demand, CIJ, the unit shipment cost. So I introduce another uh, parameter, uh, like capital C, IKMJ, which is the summation of uh, the three-part cost that uh, going from uh, demand node I to J would uh, occur. So uh, I go from I to K, so node I to hub K. From hub K, I go to hub M. From hub M, I go to node J. So I would sum it up so that the, the, in the model, it would be a little simpler and nicer, uh, avoiding, uh, I mean, confusion in the model. So as you see, I to K, K to M, M to J. And as you can see, we can do this for any other problem. As long as the thing that you're defining is a fixed number, specified by the question. So for example, this capital IKMJ, I can generate according to the uh, CIJ uh, cost that is given in the question. I'm generating another parameter, but it is still a parameter because it's a fixed value. We don't find it in the model. It's not a decision variable. You can do it in any other model. You can define your own parameters, the, the ones that are convenient for you. The decision variables, X, I, K, uh, as you notice, the index I and J I, I'm assigning to the demand nodes. The indexes, indices K and M I'm assigning to the hops. So X, I, K is one if there is a road between city I and hop K. And Y, K is equal to one if city K is a hop. This formulation, uh, similar format you have seen in like facility location problems. It's not that much different with slight changes. So in the first objective, we want to uh, minimize the total cost. So what do I have in the objective function? The demand of, uh, dem the demand of going from I to J the cost that would occur from going I, hubs K, M, and then go to J. And if I is connected to K, X, I, K, and J is connected to hub M, X, J, M. If both of them are connected, it would be a, a one value, otherwise it's gonna be zero. So if I uh, sum this up for all the three parts transportation roads, I'm gonna have the total cost of transportation, and as you know, we want to minimize it, so that's why the objective function is minimization of that expression. Any confusion? So the constraints. So as I mentioned, each demand center will be allocated to only one hub. As I told you, 
the demand nodes cannot be connected to more than one hub. It should be exactly one hub. So uh, in order to force this to the model, I say summation of xik is equal to one for each one of the nodes, and this summation is over all hops. So if I uh, sum xij over all hops, one of them should be equal to one, the others should be equal to zero. And since xij is a binary variable, it forces it to just be connected to one hop. The second one, by the way, the second one is always the most important one because uh, it's hard to see, and the question is not specifying it. You need to relate the uh, decision variables that you define. So here you have two decision variables. You have seen it in, again, facility location problem. When you want to relate xik with yk, what you do, you say that, okay, when yk is zero, meaning that node k is not really a hop. Therefore, xik should be zero for all i's, meaning that no demand node should be connected to it, assuming that it's a hop. Okay, so when I say xik is less than or equal to yk, yk being zero forces xik to be zero for all i's. But when it's one, meaning that when node k is one, node k is a hub, xik can be zero or can be one. So we allow it to be one if the model uh, needs, needs xik to be one. Any questions? But be careful, this is uh, these kind of uh, Constraints relating to random variables, especially when they're binary, it's very hard to see sometimes, and they're very important. So the question is P hop median, it's already specified that the number of hops should be uh, not equal to P, so we say that summation of yk should be equal to P, I think it's pretty obvious, and like always, we need to specify that xik and yk is binary variable to the model. So, is it a linear uh, model or not? That's the question, it's not. What's the problem? The problem is the multiplication. So W and C are parameters, and that's why uh, di differentiating between something is parameter and variable is very important. When you know that there are parameters, uh, you know that uh, multiplying them with, with xik wouldn't be uh, making them nonlinear. Okay? So wik, cik, mj, parameters, there are some fixed numbers, not an uh, important issue related to the linearity, but xik and xjm both of them are decision variables, then they are being multiplied together, so it's not linear. So you already seen how to deal with them, uh, the multiplication of two binary variables, how to make them linear. So first we define another binary variable as their multiplication, meaning that we say, Z, I, K, M, J is equal to one if both of them are one, meaning that their multiplication should be one. And when either of them are zero, or both of them are zero, Z, I, K, M, J is zero. So when I define their multiplication as Z, I, K, M, J, I can put Z, I, K, M, J instead of their multiplication in the objective function, so I'm avoiding a nonlinear expression, but how to enforce the model to know that they are equal. Z is equal to the multiplication of X's. To do so, I would introduce these two constraints. So Z, I, K, M, J should be less than or equal to either of them, X, I, K, or it should be less than or equal to X, J, M or I can just write it in one uh, specific constraint and say that this is less than or equal to their average. 
and also it should be bigger than or equal to their summation minus one. You should know this, it's a very famous and important way of linearizing the multiplication of two binary variables. So now that I enforce the relation between z and x's, and I introduce z at the end as a binary variable, I'm done. Now I have a linear model which is doing uh, the p median hop problem. So what is the second objective? Is there any problem? Any questions? So here, p hop center, again it is specifying the number of hops which is equal to the number p, but the objective before was to minimize the total cost, the objective now is to minimize the maximum origin destination travel cost. So the expression that we, in the objective function before, this expression. This expression, in order to find the total cost, we sum them up and we minimize them. But this question is not asking us to minimize the total cost. The expression is, uh, the, the model is asking us to just find the maximum value of this, this, value, this expression and minimize that one. So it is different. Minimizing the summation of an expression over the indices is different from minimizing the maximum value of that expression. I think it's understandable. But how to do this? Of course, if instead of this part, if I say maximum over all these indices, I'm done. With the same constraints, I have a p-hop problem, and the objective is changed as the, the, the question is asking. But is it enough? As you see here. It's linear problem because I already did the uh, introducing the variable z. And the objective function is being changed according to the maximum of them, minimizing the maximum of those transportation costs from uh, node i to node j. But is it linear? Uh, so, if it's not linear, what's the problem? Can anyone help me? Maximum of something is not really a linear uh, expression. So I need to change this part to something linear. And it, it is uh, as well as a very important trick to do. What I want, when I, when, whenever you're dealing with something like this, minimum of some maximum, for example, uh, let me write it better. So I have, for example, minimum of, maximum of, some expression. How to make it linear? I can say that this expression is equal to t, some, some new variable. And then I say that since t is equal to maximum of some expressions, t should be bigger than or equal to that expressions for all the indices. So minimum of maximum of some expression became minimum of t when t is bigger than or equal to that expression for all the indices. Is it understandable? So when I'm doing this, everything is linear. I'm minimizing t, and by minimizing t, I'm saying that t 
is forcing so to be to be as low as possible. So I'm forcing t to be uh, going down. So it meet, meets this equality for the maximum of this expression. It cannot go any lower. So it's the same idea that we, we were following in the above. I don't know if you have seen it in the class, but it's very important too. Any problem? So, as you see, now I'm introducing variable t, and I'm saying that t is bigger than or equal to that expression for all the indices. And be careful, these indices are exactly the same indices that we had below the summation. It should be bigger than or equal to all of them. And in the quizzes and the midterms, so the, one of the biggest problems of the students are they don't care about the indices. They don't care to write the indices in the constraints properly, but it's very important because if I don't say that t is bigger than or equal to this one, for what indices? The, the, I mean, if I just remove one of the indices, the meaning is different. Assume that I don't write any indices. I mean, uh, it, it's meaningless. So you should be careful when you're specifying the constraints. And the last parts. Hop cover. So, in the previous two parts, uh, the number of hops were equal to p. Assume that I, I'm I'm trying to uh, I'm I don't want to minimize the total cost or minimize the maximum of the cost, uh, the transportation cost. I have a limitation. I'm saying that I don't want the transportation cost going from i to j, any i to any j, be less than some threshold gamma. But the aim of my optimization is to minimize the number of hops to do so. So how to change my model? I say that if the number of hops are equal to p or are equal to the summation of yk, because yk being one means that k is a hop. So summation of yk is the total number of hops. I say that I minimize summation of yk to minimize the number of hops, but as you see in the third constraint, I'm saying that the cost of one transportation from i to j, uh, the cost of total transportation from i to j should be less than or equal to the threshold gamma. And this is the only change that you would do, and it definitely would change the solution compared to the previous two parts, but I think it's easy to understand how to do. Is it clear? Is there any, any question, problem? For parameters, you can multiply as much as you want. Because they're fixed numbers, it, it's, it's not considered as the multiplication of variables. When, when I uh, multiply two by four by eight, I still have one number, right? But when it's a decision variable, it's not a number. It's something that is changing according to the model. So uh, that's creating problems. So, this is the first question. Um, I think the next uh, question that was in the poll is the fourth question. Let's go over fourth question. So, the fourth question is something very uh, familiar. It's about 
the exam scheduling in Bilkent, which you are dealing with, we are dealing with it like every semester. Uh, it's a final exam scheduling. It's going to be for two weeks period, 14 days. And, and at each day, we have four slots uh, to, to have the exam. Let's say the set of students are S, the set of instructors are I, the set of courses are C, and the parameters that, are, that is given is that, okay, we should know that, which instructor is teaching which course, and which students is taking what course, right? So A, S, C, is equal to one if a student S is taking course C. B, I, C is equal to one if instructor I teaches course C. This is given, these are parameters. So you need to formulate an integer programming model that takes care of the following limitations. Each course should be scheduled for a time slot. Makes sense, it, you cannot have uh, a course that has not been associated or it's been associated for two, two time slots. I mean, each course, one time slot. No student has his or her two courses scheduled at the same time slot. So we cannot be there, be at two places at uh, once, so it should be different time slots. No student has more than two exams per day. It's a just a constraint. No instructor has more than one of his or her courses scheduled at the same time, time slot. So instructor should be at, the, at one exam at once. So if assuming that this is in, uh, the exams are uh, being at two different buildings, it's hard for the instructors and for, to go back and forth. So this, these are like real constraints that we already have in, in our uh, final exams as well. So the important thing is the objective function. It's a little hard to understand what does it mean. Given a particular schedule, the number of pairs of exam on the same day or on two consecutive days for a particular student is called badness count of that particular student. So if a student has two exams on Monday, two on Tuesday, one on Thursday, one on Friday, and one on Sunday, the badness count is seven. This is the key to solve this problem, to understand what is a badness count. So uh, let's consider it. So uh, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. So they are saying that two exams on Monday, two exams on Tuesday, one in Thursday, one in Friday, and one in Sunday. Right? I think that that was the restriction. So why the badness count is seven? It is saying that the number of pairs of exams on the same day or on two consecutive days. So let's count it. So for the number of exams on the same day, I have one here, one here, right? But now count for the exams on the consecutive days. I have one here, one here, one here, one here, and one here. So four here, one here. Now if we count them, four, five, six, seven. That's why the uh, badness uh, count is seven. Did you understand? Yes? No. 
Should I repeat it? So, first of all, the badness count is the summation of two consecutive day exam or exam at this, two exams at the same day, right? So I'm saying that on Monday and Tuesday, we have an exam at the same day, so I have two badness counts for that. On Tuesday and Friday, uh, sorry, Thursday and Friday, I have two consecutive exams, so one badness count there. But for Monday and Tuesday, uh, Tuesday it's tricky because the first exam on Monday is consecutive for the first exam on Tuesday, and also it is consecutive with the second exam on Tuesday. So the first exam on Monday counts twice as the consecutive exams, and the same happens for the second exam on Monday. It is consecutive with the first exam of Tuesday, and it is consecutive for the second exam of Tuesday. So over there we have four consecutive exams. Now is it understandable? So plus four, it's equal to seven. So this you should understand to, 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 to be able to model the questions. So knowing this fact, I want to solve this. So what parameters, I, uh, what decision variables I introduce? If exam course C is on time slot T of day D, X C D T is equal to one. I don't know if you saw like decision variables with three indices, but sometimes uh, not using three indices or four indices uh, makes the model even harder. So you're forced to use them. So X, C, D, T. C is for course, D is for day, T is for time slots. So if it's equal to one, means that course C is being at day T, uh, day D at time slot T. YSD is equal to one if a student S has two exams at day D. ZSD is equal to one if a student S has two consecutive exams at day D and D plus one. So variable Y is for uh, consecutive day exams. Variable Z is for the exams at the same day. I'm sorry. It was uh, vice versa. Y is for uh, two exams at the same day. Z is two consecutive exams at day D and day D plus one. So we want to minimize the sum of badness counts. And the objective function is a little messy because it, it was very hard to, I mean, maybe there are some other versions of this modeling, but when we wanted to come up with the objective function and find just the total number of badness counts, it was hard, uh, so it's a little messy, but first let me talk about the constraints and then go back to the objective function. I need to, I need to enforce that each course should be scheduled for one time slot. So, uh, this is a good way to write it. So whenever you want to say that, I need to write this for all courses, so definitely I would have, uh, for all courses as the indices of that constraint. So each course, meaning that for all courses, should be scheduled for a time slot. So the summation of X over all the days and all the time slots, meaning that the summation of X over all the uh, time should be equal to one, meaning that that course should be exactly, uh, that exam should be exactly happen once. 
because I'm summing over all the time. The second constraint is uh, making sure that no conflicts in exams for each student. So for each student, at all times, I want to have the summation of A multiplied by X over all the courses should be less than or equal to one. So first of all, what is the summation of A and X? A is equal to one if a student S is taking course C. And X is equal to one if course C is being planned for day D time slot T. So A multiplied by X being equal to one means that a student S taking course C at, time, at day D at time zone T is having the exam. So the summation of them less than or equal to one, meaning that there shouldn't be any conflict for exams of each student. And in the third constraint, I want to emphasize that no student has more than two exams per day. So for each day, for each student, the, the summation of A and X should be less than or equal to two. Meaning that it's, the number of exams cannot be more than two. No conflict in exams for each instructor. It's again, it's about multiplication of a binary parameter and binary variable. B multiplied by X. B multiplied by X is equal to one when instructor I is having course C at time, at day D at time zone T. So the summation of this over all courses should be less than or equal to one. And the last two constraints are uh, the way we associate or we link the binary variables together. As I told you before, these are very important constraints, linking all the variables together. So how does it work? If I say that for all courses, for each student at each specific day, if I sum over all the students that are taking the uh, exam, it is, uh, I mean for that specific student, sorry, for that specific student at that specific day, the total exams that that person is having for that specific day, assuming that it is zero, this expression would be minus one. So y, is, y can be zero. If the total exam that a student is having is one, again, y is bigger than or equal to one minus one being zero, not enforcing anything. But if the total exam that, is, that a specific person is having is two, two minus one is becoming one, at his in, and this enforces y to be one. And this, is, this was the exact meaning of y having two exams at the same day. So that's how we enforce, uh, we relate X and Y together. Relating X, Y to Z is more trickier because this part is saying that a specific student at a specific day is having exam, the number of those exams he has at day D plus the number of exams he had at day D plus one. But if it has like two exam at the first day and two exam at the second day, it becomes four. So Z is a binary variable, it cannot be bigger than or equal to four. So I need to uh, get rid of those uh, two exams at the day. That's why I, I say it's negative minus one plus y 
S D plus Y S D plus one. So I get rid of those uh, specific uh, exams that 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 person has like two exams at a day. Okay, I don't care to, to introducing Z. I don't care that he has two exams at that day or one exam at that day. I only care that does he has an exam at that day or not. So that's why I make them minus this expression. So assuming that now he has he has two exam as day D, two exam at D plus one. The first expression becomes this. This expression becomes not following. So this expression is the summation of all the exams at day D and D plus one. How many exams he has? Four. So this expression is four. So now this expression, YST means that is he having two exams at, at day D? Yes. Is he having exam, two exams at D plus one? Yes. So four minus three is one. So it enforces Z to be one. So I think this is more complex than I planned. So you need to think about it. Uh, this is the best way I can explain it. But if you couldn't uh, figure it out, we can discuss it in uh, office hours. Uh, not very easy model, like one of the hardest. You won't see these type of models in the exam, hopefully. But this is a good help, good introduction for you to see like harder models and I mean be comfortable to introduce binary variables with three indices and so on. So the objective function is trickier. I want to minimize the bad, uh, this badness count. Again, assume that I have Uh, two exams at day D, two exams at D plus one. So what is the badness count? First of all, I say that the summation of all the students over all days, Y, uh, so what is the number of YSD here? Here I have two exams at day D, two exams at day T plus one, so one, one. But as, as you know, I have uh, the number of badness count here should be one, two, three, four, five, six. I need to have six. So with this expression, I only have two of them. So two is done plus, what is ZSD? If he has like uh, two exams in consecutive days, so here he has two exams in consecutive days, so plus one. If he has two exams in consecutive days and he has two exams at that uh, specific day, I mean at day D, so he has like at day D he has two exams and again he has uh, exam at D and D plus one. So one, two, three. I'm sorry, two. Five. Let me count it again. One. Two, one, yes, two here, two, one here. It should be two here and two here. 
So let's count this one. If at day D, he has an exam, and at day D plus one, he has an exam, it's one, multiplying by two is two. So that's how you need to count all the badness counts. Sorry, it's too complicated, but the sum models, uh, it's even harder when you I mean, write it next time you cannot understand what you have written. So it's, uh, this is how you calculate the badness count of the objective function. As you see, this is not linear. We have multiplication of binary variables at the uh, last two expressions. You, can, you need to uh, introduce like two other binary variables to make that specific uh, expression linear, as you see. And the result of the objective function become this in a linear way. So we were able to cover two modeling at the first uh, half of the class. Uh, the next half of the class, I think it's better to focus on the last three questions because you haven't seen that much convexity and uh, like uh, geometric interpretation of linear programming. Uh, and uh, you may see them in the quizzes and midterms, so I think it's better to focus on them. 